Okay. Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for Shabbat. We thank you for Shavuot this coming up. We thank you that we can gather here in peace. And we thank you for the Torah portion. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of being in the wilderness, which is where many of us met you. And it's where many of Israel met you. Be with us today, Father. With the things that I say and the things that we hear, guide us and lead us. Your spirit, Yeshua's name. Amen. Bamidbar um, means in the wilderness, and so it comes from Numbers 1 1 of the book of Bamidbar. Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai. So that's an interesting start. It's the start of the book. It's what it was originally called. It's what it's called in Hebrew. But it ended up being called Numbers because when it starts out, it seems like there's just a whole bunch of numbers there, which is interesting. In the wilderness. It's interesting that there's really a lot that can be learned from the very first verse here. This is Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. Um, First of all, where does God speak to Israel? Well, he spoke to them in a lot of places, obviously, but in the wilderness is a special place. It's where they, we have looked at, at the previous portions through Leviticus and, and Genesis and how they all got there, Exodus, how they came out of Egypt, you know, that whole process, and then they end up at Mount Sinai, and they stay at Mount Sinai for like a year, okay? And they just hear the word of God. They learn about what they're doing. And now this book, in this book, they're going to eventually strike out. They haven't yet, but they're getting ready to go out into the wilderness. And so it's, it's really, this book is where Israel learns about life. It's really where they learn about life. So... You know, if we go back to Egypt and look at in the plagues, when they were in the plagues in Egypt, that's where they learned about the power of God. You know, it's like the question was if, of Egypt even today is who is God? Is it the God of Israel or is it some other God? Okay, is, and in ancient times it was, you know, all these pagan gods. So they learned about the power of God over all other powers, over all other entities, including the Pharaoh himself. Then they had the Passover, and at the Passover they learned that it was only the blood of the Lamb of God that could save them. If you didn't have the blood of the Lamb over your household, that was it. Not going to happen. Not saved. You're destroyed. They come to the Red Sea, and they learn to stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh, the salvation of the Lord. You know, there's a lot we can, seriously, there's a lot we can learn from this experience. And that's the whole idea. It's supposed, we're supposed to learn, the last generation is supposed to learn from the first generation that came out and not repeat their mistakes. They come to Mount Sinai and they spend a year there learning in theory, all the theory of how to relate to God, how to relate to their brother. They hear all this uh, teaching. God's teaching them through Moses, and now we come to the time where it's time to put it into practice. It's time to learn how to apply the Torah to their lives. Um, the first year is kind of like being in Sabbath school in, you know, in person. They stand by, they watch Yahweh do all these miracles. They watch him do all these amazing things, uh, his power over all the gods of Egypt, his you know, the blood of the Lamb saving the firstborn of Israel, seeing the Red Sea parting as he's standing there and says, stand still and see the salvation, see the Yeshua of Yahweh. So I think about this and I go, you know, it's real easy to learn about the Bible. It's real easy to lay in bed at night and read it or on the weekend when you're not doing anything, lay there and read it. But when it comes to applying it to our lives and to our relationships, we know what it says. That's not the problem. 
Anybody ever had a problem with what it says? I don't, I don't have a clue what it says. No. We have a problem plugging it in. Okay. We know what it says. And the problem is, you know, really if we could take the test on paper, say, Lord, just give us the paper. Like, what, am I, what do you do in this situation? Multiple choice. You can do this or this or that one, of course. But in real life, you won't pick that one, will you? It's like, you know, you pick the wrong one knowing it's the wrong one. <laughs> and so why is that? The problem is it involves our heart. It involves our flesh. It involves our emotions. It involves our, our feelings, which God really never asks you about your feelings. You know that story, right? And, and so really... The new covenant is that he wants to get it off of paper. He doesn't want to give us a paper test. He wants to get it out of the book, get it out of the stone, and put it into our hearts so that what's in here and what's on paper will be the same thing, that our automatic reaction will be what he's instructed us to do. That's the new covenant. That's what it's about. That's what Yeshua wants us to do. So life is to prove Really, it's like, why do we have to go through this? Well, it's a demonstration, really, of what we believe. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe in our hearts what we say on our lips? Do we really believe that? Are we, is it in our heart enough that we'll actually do it? Okay. One, one. Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the tabernacle, in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation. So he's there in the tabernacle, which has been erected. Tells us when it is. It's on the first of the second month in the second year after they come out of Egypt. So this is like, you know, 13 months or so after they actually left Egypt. He's been here about a year at Mount Sinai getting instructions. Okay. The tabernacle actually is set up in the first month. Um, in the, this is the second month. The tabernacle is actually set up in the first month. The book of Numbers is not actually written in chronological order. He wants us, he starts with the structure. We're going to see that here in a second. He starts it in, in telling us about the structure and the order. And this book really takes place in really in three basic locations. And the travels between those locations. It's not just they're just wandering slowly, slowly, slowly. He picks some spots and there's just like big events happen there. So the first one, of course, is Mount Sinai. That's where it starts out. That's where we are today, Mount Sinai. And then they strike out and come to Kadesh Barnea. And that's where they had the issue with the spies. Got there right away. No big deal. Okay. And then they move on to the plains of Moab eventually with the last generation after what happened with the spies when they wouldn't go in the land. And so there's a Torah teaching that I mentioned really kind of made reference to it that any good Torah teacher will tell you that the Torah, there's a subtle teaching in there that the last generation can expect the same challenges as the first generation. That's what happens here at Sinai. The generation that refused to go in the land didn't get, didn't, didn't pass the test. They didn't get to go in. And Caleb and Joshua, of course, get to go in. But the whole generation dies. It's the next generation. That last generation went into the land. So I just think it's interesting, what's the likelihood of this actually happening again in our day concerning Israel? That there's a generation that comes into the land that's not quite willing to take it. Even though they know Yahweh's on their side, their confession is, you know, Yahweh's on their side, Yahweh gave them the land. There's still some giants there that they're afraid of, though. Okay? And they just won't quite take the land. And, and it's interesting that today, those, that generation that came into the land in 1948 is slowly passing away. And there's still no temple. You know, they talk about temples. They're ready to build temples. There's designs for temples. I've seen blueprints for temples. I don't see a temple. What's going on? Why 50 years later is there still no temple? It's because they really haven't taken the land. You know, they're right there at the land. just really haven't taken it. So it's, this is interesting to me. It's like it's going to be that second generation of Israel that are born there that's going to take the land back from the Palestinianites okay, who are holding it. So, if we look back up just a little bit, 
we see here in Exodus, it says it happened in the first month in the second year. On the first month, the tabernacle was raised up. So you see where we are here is actually after that in the, in the book. We're in the second month. So it was actually raised up here, and it's going to go back and talk about that later. But he wants to start out. I find that's sort of interesting too. Why does he start out here in this book telling us about something, and this is why? He wants us to understand the structures. He wants us to understand the order. There is order in God's kingdom. This is not random. It's like, take the sum of the congregation of the sons of Israel according to their families by their father's house and number the names of every male by their heads from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And that's um, the Hebrew word there is groups, I mean, they came out of Egypt, what, it, some, some uh, translation says in their armies, martial array, in other words, it is not, um, the, the movie shows them actually coming out just a blob of people, didn't happen, they come out in order, in structure, by their groups, by their family groups, and that's why it says, it mentions their family, by, according to their family, so they're coming out by their tribes, okay, so, this Western idea that we have of a man being on some, each man's on his own lonesome spiritual journey, you know, is, is completely foreign to Israel and to the Bible. It, you're not by yourself. It's actually a pagan idea. It's actually the, it's the devil's ideal. If he can get you out on your own, you know, I like what Sherelle said the other day. It's like, Said the banana that gets separated from the bunch gets peeled. <laughs> That's a good one. You know, and um, it's his ideal. If he can se separate us from the congregation of Israel, he knows we're vulnerable, right? I mean, you get you out on your own, you start getting your own ideas. You know, the Bible describes Hasatan as a wolf in sheep's clothing. What do wolves do? You know, the wolves don't just like. There is a big flock. I think I'm going to take them out and just new, new, new. He sits back and looks for the ones that's on the edge, the ones, the stragglers, the ones that are coming in late, dragging up the back, okay? That's the, one he's, the ones on the edge, okay? And, uh, you know, looks for the ones that just, you know, like, well, exactly. So that is the, he did that coming out of Egypt through Amalek, and we're going to talk about that some more. And he does it today. He doesn't change his tactics because they work. That's why it's so predictable. It's like when something works, he just do this, does it again. He's not stupid. It's like, well, that worked. And every time I've tried it, it worked. Why should I just do something different? Israel came out in this as a unit, organized, martial array as an army. They walked together. They worshiped together. They danced together. They fought together. And they won together with Yahweh leading them. Okay? They're not on their own. They're a unit. Those who are on the fringes are the ones who fell into trouble. You know, Those are the ones who... Actually, if you think about it, the story of Israel, the ones that were on the fringes, in and out, in and out, coming in and out, those are the ones that brought trouble back into the camp. Think about when they went out and started participating with the pagan groups around them. Women and men. I mean, you can think of Diana. You can think of the ones that, you know, um, Balaam. That's what he said. You know, we just get, need some of them to go over here and start worshiping with these guys. You know, and they'll bring that back in the camp. Over and over and over and over. That uh, situation where people didn't really see themselves as part of Israel but would go out and come back, that's when they got in trouble. And they would bring it back with them, bring it back in the camp. And so. We see that lesson over and over and over, and we're going to see it in, in the book of Numbers and throughout the Torah. You see that. This is interesting because it tells us here about a specific group of people, 20 years old and upward, that are able to go forth to war in Israel. Okay? Has anything changed? Not really. What Israel is needs a core group that is willing to go to war. Not just physical war, but also spiritual war. Okay? That's who's being numbered. The word war is used in the book of Numbers 31 times. 
more than any other book of the Bible, more than Joshua, you know, takes Israel and literally goes to war, fights all the Canaanites. No, 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 used, that's like only 18 times in that whole book where it's actual war. There's very little actual war in the book of Numbers, but it talks about war over and over and over that they're ready for war. Israel is ready to fight. They are in martial array, they're organized, and they're ready to fight, whether it's, whether it's their spiritual enemy or their physical enemy. And Israel is about to, in this book, about to face a spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle is going to be with each one of them when they take, same as with you, by the way, when we take this Torah knowledge, this book learning, and go try to apply it. We're going to be at war with our flesh. We're going to be at war with our friends. We're going to be at war with the enemy. You know, he's going to be playing everything he can play, pulling everything he can do. So we, we have to, we're going to be at war, putting it to the test in our lives and in our hearts. Okay? But if we do it as an army, if we do it as a nation, you know, where we can just say, hey, man, I just had a, you don't believe what happened at work today. You know, it's like this happened and this happened. Like, okay, well, da, 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 da. Hey, man, you busy? You got a minute? Let me take, you know. And we do it as a unit. We might not all be standing there just because of the way the world works, but we're self, everybody's got a cell phone, you know. You're, you're like that far away, okay. And you say, hey, this is what's going on. And so what's interesting here is, Imagine how much it helps if you know that you've got to go to war for Israel. You're going to war spiritually or physically. And you know there's over half a million people standing with you who are warriors. Maybe you've got to go to war because there's a sickness in your life. Think of how much better you feel if you know there's a group of warriors standing with you. Amen? It matters. Not only does it matter to us emotionally, it matters spiritually that Israel stand as a unit, okay, and stand as one. Yahweh is one. He's teaching us to be one. Israel is one. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, one of the, of the head of the house of his father. So we not only have all the... People who are ready to go to war, they have leaders, okay? The head of the house, that means the leader of that tribe, the one they recognize. You know, he's not, okay, yes, our leader is, uh, he went to India and he's on the top of a mountain with the guru. No, he's there with them doing his job, okay? He's present, okay? Life is about, his life really is going to be about the people that he's leading. It's not about him. And he's not running off doing something different. He's doing, he is giving, he's be, being a servant, really. If you think about it, a few chapters from here, actually, the Bible calls Moses the most humble of all men. It calls him meek. It calls him gentle. Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble or meek or gentle more than all the men who were on the surface of the earth. You think, and he's re leading like three million people or something, you know? You think you, you picture like Patton or somebody out there. No, that doesn't work. He's one of them. He's part of, he's, we're believers, you know, Believers are called to be servants. We are, a, we are an army of servants. The army of Israel is servants. Moses' life is not about pride or arrogance or doing it his way or self or what he feels like. His life is about doing it Yah's way. That's what it was about. And that's what made him. And, and Yah's way was to have Moses to care for the flock of Israel. And so he's the greatest model for us all. You know, we're all called to be servants, right? We're all called to be servants. Matthew chapter 20, Yeshua speaking here, it says, whoever desires to be a chief, a leader among you, let him be your servant. By the way, you want a great leader? Find somebody who's a great follower. Somebody really pays attention. They do that, by the way, they do that like in, in Alaska when they're like the lead dog. They look for a dog that's really paying attention. 
that is like, like this super leader that is paying attention to the one that drives the sled. He's just, I want to do what you want. I want to do. That's what Moses, that's what we're supposed to look like. We're supposed to be looking to God, looking to his words. Like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And he will put you in a position of authority. They take that dog and they put him in the lead. Because they know he's following the king. They know he's following the master. That's what you want. They don't take some big brutal, you know, thing that's barking at everybody. Oh, he's the baddest one. Let's put, mm -mm, doesn't work. You just have a dog fight. <laughs> you freeze to death out in the snow somewhere and you lose the idea to Roderick, okay? So, to be Israel really is to be ready to serve the congregation of Israel. And that's where blessings are. This really, it really is. It goes on and says, let him be your servant. Even as the son of man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life. I mean, you picture Yeshua coming in and, and washing the feet of the disciples. It's even freaking them out. It's like, what are you doing? It's like, you know, I know what I'm doing. Do you know what I'm doing? That's the question. <laughs> He's like... He calls himself the son of man. That's a prophetic statement um, uh, from prophecy about the son of man coming. So they, they would know who he was. In Colossians 4, Paul talks about himself being a servant. He uses the phrase bond servant a lot throughout his writings. He says, all my, affair, all my affairs will be known to you by Thyacus, the beloved brother, faithful servant and fellow bond servant. He's sold out. He's a sold slave. I have sold myself as a slave. That's what bond servant means. To who? To Yeshua. Yeah. Sold out to him. So if we're, that's, we sold out to Messiah, it's going to work. Now this is interesting. Revelation 19 John said, I fell at the feet. This angel's talking to him. He falls at the feet. because This is interesting because throughout the scripture, there's this phrase called the angel of the Lord, and people fall at his feet. He accepts worship, and all of a sudden you realize, this is not a regular angel. This is God, okay? So John's not really sure who's talking to him here. If this is a real angel or this is just God in, a, in the flesh as an angel. Falls, and what does the angel said? He says, don't do that. I am your fellow servant. That's interesting because I never thought of angels as relating to us. He said, I'm your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Yeshua. Isn't that interesting? An angel actually relating to us. We know they're a higher being, okay? They're spirit being. But that's interesting that they, no, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. I'm here to help you. I'm your fellow servant. I'm a, I'm a, you have the testimony of Yeshua. I, apparently he has the testimony of Yeshua because he says, I'm your brother. I'm with you and your brothers. So even the angels understand their place in the kingdom. They don't violate that position. You know, God's kingdom is one of order and structure. It has boundaries. It has borders. And, and that's true physically and spiritually in Israel. They move orderly. I mean, how else do you get a couple million people, you know, to go do something? We, we try to do tabernacles, try to get just a, a hundred people to, to go, you know, to eat. <laughs> it's like... I was like, where is Moses? What kind of shofar did he really have? I want one. Okay? Let's go. Cool. But really the problem is from the way we think today. We think we've been, and I thought about it, and this really started in the 60s. It really did. It was around, there was always rebels and everything, but in the 60s it became this thing, that everybody for their self, it's whatever you, you know, feels good, do it. Okay? Whatever you think, you know, do your own thing. T-shirts, you all remember that, do your own thing. Okay, everybody doing their own thing. That's not God's way. And, and who was, and we know who was all up in the middle of the 60s too. I mean, it's obvious who was behind it now that we're not in it. It was, you know, from the enemy. And so what he does is separate us. And that makes us easy to pick off. Makes us easy to pick off. Get us scattered. Everybody doing your own thing, thinking your own way. It's contrary to the word. The word says that there's a way that sounds right to a man. The end of which is destruction. Or death, depending on the translation. Okay, so the, the interesting thing about the 60s is that they actually, it, it actually celebrated rebellion. Probably started with uh, the movie Rebel Without a Cause. Who remembers that? Oh, like, okay, a couple people. Okay. Probably started with that, because that was like early 60s, really even before the hippie movement and stuff. That's when it was all starting. Rebels, you didn't even need a cause to be a rebel. Just be a rebel. Revelation 22 
goes on, he says, Then he said to me, Behold, see, I don't bow down. I'm your fellow servant of your brothers and of your um, fellow servant and of your brothers, the prophets. This is another place he's saying the same thing. And those who keep the words of this book. He's like, don't worship me. Worship God. Okay, so this is a, uh, a, a, a messenger. This is a messenger. This is a true angel. Okay. And what we've done, though, is we've slowly entered this weird phase. You know, we've got a whole world that's kind of at war internally. Uh, Europe is just all messed up. It's like this, all this bombing and everything going on inside the country. It's going on around the world for those who have not maintained their boundaries and their borders. Okay. And, and it's, it's, it's really weird. It almost looks like the last war is just going to be everywhere at once. That's an enemy that's very difficult to fight because we haven't, Israel hasn't maintained its borders as a people as they're scattered in the nations. When it comes to the camp of Israel, which is described here in this part, um, it gives us all these numbers, and I just went right to the numbers here, have them all added up. And we literally don't know how, what, what the tents set up look like, but virtually no matter how you try to do it, he says, these three tribes camp to the north, these three tribes to the south, these to the east, these to the west, okay? And when you look at the numbers, you've got, you've got the layout inevitably creates a cross. It just inevitably, I don't, I don't care what it is, it could be more, more bulky, but it's ultimately going to create a cross no matter what you do due to the actual numbers. You've got 186,000 on the bottom. Okay, there's, there's Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun all added up. There, it says they camp to the east. Okay, and to the east, um, they're the largest ones. Straight up from that, Ephraim up here, the 108,000. Okay, so the big difference here, 80,000 more people than up here, so roughly. And so you have a big difference. This is going to be short. This is going to be longer. And then on either side... You got 151,000, 157,000. So there's like a balance there. Now you think Yahweh knew what this was going to look like? I mean, he could have mixed them up any kind of way to come up whatever number he wanted to. And it's like, he's like, you know, in the last days, people are going to look at this and know this is nothing new. This, is, well, this was the plan. This is the plan for Israel right here. Israel is a picture. Israel is supposed to be a picture of salvation. They literally are in, in the physical, just the way they can't. And so, since this is the book of Numbers, I want to look at some of the numbers. And, and it gives us all the numbers. I just yeah, added them all up. I won't go through all the stuff. But here's all the tribes. And what ends up happening is as you look at the listing of the tribes and the way they're numbered, it's, it's a little bit confusing. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of the 12 tribes of Israel. And one thing to keep in mind is a couple of things happen. The tribe of Levi is, often is not counted because they're set apart for God as ministers in the temple. So they're often not counted. And also the tribe of Joseph was Ephraim and Manasseh, his, his Egyptian sons, were, were adopted by Jacob or Israel as full sons. So that will, if you take Joseph out and pl plug two in, you've, got one, you've actually got one extra. You've got 13 tribes. Okay. The book of Revelation has some interesting numbers in it about the 12 tribes. And, and let's start by looking at that because it, it goes through these tribes and it's very interesting. Look at this. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it is given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Do not hurt the earth and the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000, having been sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Okay, so that's like 144,000, Yahweh's elect, and then it goes through this long detail, 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe, 12 times, you know, 12,000 is 144,000, 12 times 12 is 144. Um, but if we just look, it's like if we count Levi and we count, not Joseph, but Ephraim and Manasseh, we're actually going to have 14 tribes, and you're going to have 168,000. So something happens here. I want you to look closely. 
Something happens here. Let's look. It goes through and it describes what tribes it's talking about. It mentions the tribe of Judah. I won't read the whole thing. It mentions Reuben. It mentions Gad. And they're all, you see, 12,000 out of every tribe. 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtali, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Issachar, 12,000. Okay? So, did you notice that Levi's there? So, if Levi's there, we've got extras. Didn't I just see Manasseh in the previous slide? Okay? So this is about to get a little strange. Out of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. What's Joseph doing in there? We just saw Manasseh was in there. If Manasseh's in there, what's Joseph doing in there? We should have like 15 tribes if everybody's mentioned at this point. Or 14 tribes, I guess. At least 14. So either there's not 12 tribes here. Or somebody's missing. So let's take a look. There wouldn't be room. All together, this actually equals 144,000. He lists 12. He actually lists 12. 12,000 each. And it adds up to 144,000. So I laid it out here so you can see it. This is in Genesis over on the left where it describes, you know, when the sons were born. This is their birth order that they were born in. We see Levi is listed there. Joseph is listed there. So we've got all the tribes. But what happens is, in numbers where we are today, and that's why I'm going here to make this all balance, is we have Joseph is represented by Ephraim and Manasseh. And in numbers we see, this is the list from the book of Numbers, Levi is not mentioned. So we still have 12. We have 12 here. We have 12 here because Levi is not mentioned because it's numbering the men of war. Does Levi go to war? Levi doesn't go to war. Okay? So he's not a man of war. He's, he's a man of God. Okay? So he's not supposed to go to war. Now in Revelation, kind of tried to keep him in order as much as possible. It doesn't work that great, but um, we got seven tribes and we got 144,000 and, and here Levi is back. Okay? So, there should be too many, but there's 12, so somebody has to be missing. As we look close, uh, let's see, who we've got Joseph down here again. That's interesting. But, oh my goodness, we've got Manasseh. How can you have Manasseh and Joseph and Levi and only have 12? Now, I hear you all are picking out somebody's missing. It has to be more than one person missing, Okay. So, if you look at the Genesis, you're starting to get a, okay? So, let's see who's missing. Let me just change this a little bit. So, this is what we were doing. We were taking Joseph, who's, we can take, we take him out of this list and put two in in his place, but over here, he's in the list. And we see Levi's here, but Dan is not here. We also see that Manasseh is here, but Ephraim is not here. Manasseh's here, Joseph's here, Ephraim is missing, and Dan is missing. Dan, and Eph Dan is in Genesis and Numbers, but not in Revelation. So what is going on? Why are Dan and Ephraim not part of the 144,000? God make a mistake? No. No. He didn't make a mistake. In fact, this is carefully calculated to come up with 144,000. This is carefully calculated to come up with 12 tribes. You know, the answer is going to be in God's word. You know, so just think about what do we know about the tribe of Dan and the tribe of, of Ephraim? What do they have in common? They both went into idolatry. They both decided they wanted to do it their own way instead of Yah's way. It has consequences. Even with biblical tribes, it has consequences, okay? And so, they both went up north. They set up their own worship days. They both get involved in idolatry. And what does Yahweh have to say about that? Judges 18.30, it says, And the sons of Dan set up an engraved image or a graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, 
he and his sons were the priests of the tribe of Dan until the captivity. Okay? So, Dan, look at this, 49.6. This is back um, when the tribes are being blessed. There's some strange prophecies here, and one in particular about Dan. It starts out, they're being blessed. Um, Jacob is blessing his sons, and he's, and he's very prophetic. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Okay, he's right there doing what he's supposed to be doing, but there's a second part. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse's heels so its rider shall fall backwards. Like, what? What is that about? He becomes a serpent. He becomes a snake. Okay, that causes the riders to fall. What, what is that? What's that picture? Okay, there... Okay, the horse, you know, that's carrying the people, that's carrying the tribes, their belief system, their God, their understanding, all of that. If that's broken, if any of that is broken by some attack by the serpent, they're going to fall, right? Let's see what it says. It's interesting how this pattern actually sounds very similar to what um, is in the book of, of Genesis. But, so here it says he's going to, it says he's a serpent, actually says he's an adder type of serpent, poison snake, bites the horse's heel, the riders fall. So, Genesis 3, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Yahweh had made. You don't think Dan would be like participating with the devil here, huh? No, of course he is. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's talking to the serpent. He's talking to the snake saying to the snake, you shall bruise his heel. He bites the horse's heel. The rider falls. The whole of mankind fell. So all of mankind fell in Genesis 3. And now, in, as Dan goes north, Israel, part of Israel falls. Okay, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Ephraim. Let me show you how that all works. Judges 17 talks about it. It says, there's a man in the hill country of Ephraim. He's an Ephraimite. His name is Micah. Micah, actually. Okay. What does he do? In those days, there was no king in Israel, and it was 1964, and everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, and then by 2000, early 2000, that was normal. Everybody's just doing their own thing. Okay. Just doing what's right. Now I'm just going to go out and I'll just do what's right. And I, you know, I've got a special relationship with God. I don't really need to worry about the Bible. I'm, I'm really good at this because I used to do it. And that's why I was talking about Wednesday night at Midrash. It's like, this is like, hits home with me because in my younger days, this is actually what I was doing. Talks about this guy Micah and he says, uh, Micah and his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gives them to a silversmith who made a carved image and a molten image out of it. And the man Micah, is actually his mother, has a house of God, gods and he made an ephrod and, and a teraphim, which both of those, uh, that teraphim is a healer god that they were praying to. And consecrated one of his sons who became the priest. Is that like doing it your own way? I mean, it's like no Levites, no sons of Aaron, he just like taking somebody, okay. Um, so it's not worshiping, but we look at it and go, oh, they're worshiping pagan gods, right? No, watch closely. The same thing happens here that happened at Mount Sinai when 3,000 people were killed. Remember when they came down, it's like, these be your, be your gods? Look at Judge. Judges 17 said, He restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I most certainly dedicate this silver. So he'd give it to his mother. His mother gives it back to him. I most certainly dedicate this silver to Yahweh from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a molten image. Okay? In Exodus, at Mount Sinai, when they first get there, and Moses, this man Moses, I don't know where he went. He went up. The, he's not coming back. They take off their golden earrings, interesting golden earrings, 1968, it's the name of one of the top rock groups. How many remember that? Y'all do, don't you? Radar Love, that was the song, okay? You remember that if you don't. That was golden earring. Where did they get that? They got it from right there. 
So that's that same rebellious thing. They take off all their golden earrings and bring them to Aaron, and he makes a molten calf and says, let's go worship a pagan god. Nope. These be your gods, Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Israel. In fact, he goes on to say, he said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. They're not worshiping pagan gods. They're in idolatry. It's different. They claim to be working, or worshiping Yahweh the Most High, but instead they're doing it their way. We love the Lord. We love God. We know, we know who Yahweh is. Yes, he, you know, he's the one we trust. But you don't trust his word. They go up in the north. Judges 18, it goes on. said they called the name of their city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born in Israel. So who are we dealing with? We're dealing with Dan. Watch happens. And the children of Dan set up for themselves engraved or carved images. And they set up for themselves Mika's engraved images which he made. So there you get there you get these two tribes linking together. Okay, you get the Ephraimite, Mika, and, and all his group, this worshiping image, link up with Dan, okay, and they're up in the north. Of course, they end up making a, a false altar and all that, which actually is a great excavation to see. I should have thrown some pictures in there. Hosea speaks to the prophets, actually, all speaks to us. Ephraim has joined himself to idols. Get away from him. Leave him alone. Just stay away from him. Okay? Amos 8. Behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread or, or for thirst for water, but for hearing Yahweh's words. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria say, as the God of Dan lives, excuse me, as the way of Beersheba lives, they will fall and never rise up. So they're focusing, what is the sin of Samaria? Did they believe in Yahweh, the Samaritans? Absolutely. To this day they do. But did they do it Yah's way? Nope. Remember Yeshua and the disciples go through there and the lady says to him, it's like, uh, so who's right? Do we worship here on this mountain like our fathers say? Or do we worship in Jerusalem? He said, salvation is of the Jews. Of Judea probably is what he said. Because it wouldn't have came through in the translation. Salvation is of the Judeans is probably what he said. Or in Judea. Because there's no way to... That's a Greek problem. Okay. So, you see what's going on here. So, in Samaria, they're doing it their own way. They're doing it in their own place. They're doing it their own days. Be careful with the Samaritan text. If you're playing with Torah and you're like, oh, what does the Samaritan text say? Remember that it's, it's a distorted text. Because they tweaked things to make it sound right because they weren't doing what the real word said. Okay? So, it's that same thing. It's about doing it their own way. Now, the question is, do people here in the last days, are we seeing the same thing? Where people claim to be worshiping God, we claim to be worshiping Yeshua, it's like He is our God, He is the one we worship, He is, uh, but we would never fall into idolatry. We would never make an idol and bow down and pray before it. We would make several. Okay? <laughs> this one is interesting to me. This is Mary and the baby Jesus, and it's just kind of very interesting. If you look closely... Who's holding the scepter? Mary's holding the scepter. Who's wearing the crown? Now here's the trick one. Who's waving like the Pope waves? See that? <laughs> He's got that little Pope wave thing going on. It's like, oh my goodness. I just seriously, I mean, that's, that's no accident. That's the way the Pope waves. Here's a... This particular statue, it's here in Florida. You can go see it. It's in Orlando. Huge place in Orlando. The name of this statue is called Mary, Queen of the Universe. Okay? Created by artist Bill Burke. This is a quote. It is the signature statue of the Shrine of Mary, Queen of the Universe. When did Mary get to be the Queen of the Universe? I don't read that in Scripture. Okay? So I copied and pasted this so you would know this, this is from the website of the Basilica of the National Shrine of Mary, Queen of the Universe at 8300 Vinland Avenue in Orlando, Florida. The gift of indulgences. You thought indulgences were over, didn't you? Not if we're doing it our way. There never was any in the Bible, but if we're still doing it our way instead of Yah's way, okay? So you know what that is. You go in and you do something that gains you favor. You can go commit a sin. 
How about a sin you? You want adultery? That's going to cost you. You know? It's crazy. For those who seek an indulgence, there's a requirement of a recitation of certain prayers, visiting a specific place of pilgrim, like, just like Mary did, or engaging in specific acts of charity, particularly to that box right over there. Seri no, that was, we don't have a box. I think Chris looked like, is there a box? No, I'm like, that's what they say. <laughs> that's why I pointed to, to there's, no, there, not here. This is, a, this is a quote. It's a copy and paste. As soon as Ephraim started doing things their own way, they stepped into, just like these folks, bless their heart, they step into spiritual blindness. That is a spiritual reality. As soon as you start working contrary to the word, every step that's contrary to the word, there's blindness, 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 blindness. It becomes occultism. It's occulting. You can't see. It's a type of occultism. There is religious occultism, and that's what we're dealing with here. They can't, you go talk to these people, they're going to have their great people, great heart. They're not going to be able to see it. They will be absolutely convinced they're doing the right thing, okay? And so we have people on the edge and on the fringes outside of Israel. You know, they love the Lord, they love Yeshua, they love Jesus, doing it their own way. They're learning off the internet where there's absolutely no accountability and walking in the most blatant unbelievable and difficult to break spiritual blindness I have ever seen. It's amazing what's going on out there. You would think if people had the right heart that it would be easy to lead them. Not if they're in a religious occultism. And that's what this creates. And it's very difficult to break. Very difficult to break. The Samaritans to this day still have their place in Samaria. They still worship on their own days. They still do Passovers. And they're doing it. They're, they're Passovers. You want to see a Passover service in Israel? Go to Samaria. They've been doing it for years. In the wrong place. Thinking they're doing the right thing. Okay? Okay? Ephraim and Dan, you know, doing the same thing. They're, they're doing it in what's right in their eyes, but it's not right in God's eyes. You know, the whole council of Scripture, they've got it, and they're not doing it. And the result is they're not, Ephraim and Dan are not part of the 144,000 chosen for that very reason. And this is what the spirit of Amalek, it wants to get people out on the fringes, out from under the protection and the accountability of a congregation so they can pick you off. That's what it wants. Amalek is a demonic spirit. Okay. Deuteronomy 25, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he happened upon you along the way and attacked those among you in the rear, all the stragglers behind you. When you were tired, you were weary, okay? That's when he comes after you. He's not going to come up and attack the group, okay? He picks off the butterflies that are flitting around the edge of the congregation of Israel, okay? When you jack when you reject the congregation of Israel, you really reject the protection that God has placed over it. There's a covering. There's a protection. There's borders. There's boundaries. It's a covering. You get out and start doing it your own way. You're under your own protection. You're, under, you're, you know, you're operating on your own timetable. And when the enemy catches you out there in a moment of weakness and you're tired like a little Bambi, you got you. Before you know what happens. And you just kind of disappear. And it's like, what, whatever happened to, who, who was their name? I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. That's what happened to them. Hebrews 13. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Okay. Leaders will have to give an account for what they do, for what they permit, what they allow to go on. And I think that one of the things that bothers me the most is for those that I let drift in and drift out without grabbing them and getting their attention. Because when you see them drift away, you go, Phew. the enemy got them. And you don't expect it. You don't expect it. The ones you're not expecting. You know? The little butterflies get netted. And pretty soon they're on somebody's butterfly connection. And when that happens, the leaders groan. It says, 
Let them serve with joy and not with groaning, but when you lose somebody, you do groan. So it would be no advantage to groan. James talks about it. He said, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that those that we who teach, you're going to be judged with a greater strictness. And that's why there's a responsibility. Okay? The attitude of the leadership. I mean, people, people take these same verses that I'm sharing with you and create a hierarchy, create a kingdom that's about their self. And it's called a cult. And so what's the test? How do you know? The test is, if leadership is in a position of servitude, if it's a servant, which is what we're called to do, you have a congregation. That's pretty easy. Okay? But if the leadership in, in anything, not just a congregation, in anything, if the leadership is just a position of power and control, you got a cult. If the leadership is just trying to keep you there. I'm talking about congregations. Like, is he trying to keep you? If I'm trying to not allow you, if I'm scared for you to go somewhere else and visit, even just a visit, or no, if you go hear that music group, you're just going to be, you know, I mean, I might warn you if it's demonic, I'm going to tell you that, by the way, that's demonic. Stay away from that. But just to go visit somewhere else, Oh, you can't, they don't believe, they, one house, two house, you know, let's all go to the Jews' house. We can't, you know, we can't do any of that. We can't go listen to Paul Wilbur because he's in the wrong kind of house. No, we don't have, I don't have a problem with that. There's people that would virtually disown you if you came here. There's a word for that. That's a cult. First Peter 5. Therefore, I exert, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Messiah, and who would also share in the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not for dishonest gain, but willingly, neither lording it over those entrusted to you. That's how you tell if it's a cult. They create these things where if you leave, you feel 100%. I've seen, I've, I have had people come to me and say, I wish I could go there and start crying. I said, but I can't. Really? You're under that kind of pressure. Okay. I can't come play at your Feast of Tabernacles. We'll be disowned. We won't ever be able to play in our congregations again. That's happened more than once. People looking. One guy I'm on the phone with, him and his daughter, we're setting it up. Going to be a good time. He's flicking through our website. He's like, oh my goodness, you guys believe in two houses of Israel, don't you? I'm like, yeah, we do. He's like, I, 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 I almost panicked. I can't, be, I can't have any part of that. I can't be any around. I can't be around it. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm just, just panicked. Really? Had another group wanted to come and do a demonstration at our Feast of Tabernacles. Found, oh, you guys, you guys are having these people there? Yeah. Oh, oh. The rabbi said we can't come because that's a cult. I'm like, that's a cult? Look in a mirror. It's like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> our, our people can go to yours. They're welcome to go there. Well, you don't have one, but if you had one, it's, it's amazing. See what the enemy does is he twists things just a little bit. Keeps the truth there, but he twists it. He twists the order. And what sounds good ends up being bad, and what sounds bad ends up being good because it's out of order. It's just an order issue. 1 Peter 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here's an interesting one. You know, it's the spirit of pride that leads us into idolatry. And one of the idolatries is we, that the enemy, the enemy will just tell you, it's like, oh yeah, you can do, don't worry about congregation, you don't need that. You can go out to the river and do Sabbath by yourself. When the scripture says, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath, a holy convocation. It is one. That's what it is. If it is one, how are you going to convocate by yourself? But the enemy, he told me that for years. And I finally see this verse. I said, you can't, you can't keep that command by yourself, can you? 
even though I had tried for a long time, thought I was doing it, felt good about it. Okay? That's what he does. That's how he tweaks it a little bit. You think you're doing it. I'm resting. It's the seventh day. I got all the pieces here, but they're in the wrong order. I'm supposed to be doing it with my brothers. And that's not, I mean, I get it. If you're in jail or you're just physically not here, I get that. I mean, you, can, you thought why we had doorboat.com, right, John? <laughs> it's like, Don's a thousand miles away and he's keeping it with him. Revelation 21. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having a great high wall, having 12 gates, and the gates had 12 angels, and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, this is where we start scratching our head, or our beard if we're men. Which 12 tribes are on the names, on the gates, Okay. Well, the reality is the only tribes mentioned in the book of the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, the kingdom of the universe, it, it doesn't mention Ephraim and Dan in any of its list. It doesn't mention them. So it does have Joseph. It does have Levi. So does that mean that Ephraim and Dan don't get to go into the New Jerusalem? No, that's, that don't sound right. No, it just means their name is not recognized because of the idolatry. They're going to probably have to go in as the tribe of Joseph. Okay, so how is that possible? Because Joseph is listed as a tribe. How is that possible? The tribe of Zebulun. Okay, this is the last verse we left off at. 12,000, Joseph 12,000, Benjamin 12,000, that was 144,000. We've discovered there that Dan and Ephraim are missing. Romans 11, and if some of the branches are broken off, you think Paul realizes this problem? I mean, it happened way before his day. Okay, Paul knows what, Paul, that's not just a random talking about, he's talking about whole tribes that got broken off. If some of them got broken off, don't get all caught up in yourself that you got grafted in, right? That's what he's talking about. He knows about that. Don't get caught up in pride and say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. It's true. It's unbelief. They were broken off. And you stand by your faith. So don't be proud, but fear. Why? Because if God didn't spare the natural branches, he's not going to spare you either. That's why it says fear, revere, pay attention, be sober. Okay? This is serious. For if you were cut out of a branch that's wild olive tree, a wild branch by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more will these, which natural branches, which were broken off by unbelief, will be grafted back into their own olive tree? That's what he's talking about. For I don't desire that you be ignorant, brothers. This is a mystery so that you won't, don't get all wise in your own thoughts here, your own conceits. There's a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, that idea, the fullness of the Gentiles. So all those who can come in, the fullness of the Gentiles. And so all Israel will be saved, even as it is written. So all Israel, all tribes, does that mean Ephraim and Dan also? Okay. How are they going to do that? How are they going to get grafted back in? This verse goes on. All Israel will be saved, even as it is written, there will come out of Zion the deliverer. And he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob or Israel. This thing calls him Jacob here, you know, because it's talking about the fleshly people. They're going to become Israel again. The ones that are broken off can become Israel through the deliverer. You have to be delivered. Hence, deliverance ministry. Okay. So, now can we count all the numbers? So, so what's going to happen then? Wait a minute. We had 12 tribes. And if, and if this happens, if the Messiah comes along, we know that's who that is. And he brings these other tribes. And now we don't have 12 tribes. And how are we going to count Israel? This is a book of numbers about counting Israel. So how is this going to happen? Revelation 7 answers the question. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no man could count. Out of every nation and of all the tribes and people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. 
Men can't do it, but the deliverer can do it. Messiah can do it. That's what this is about. They can be grafted back in through Messiah Yeshua. That's the plan. One of the elders says to me, who are these people? Who are they and where did they come from? All these people, these thousands and thousands that we can't come. And I thought, Lord, you know, I don't. He said, these are those that came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb or in the Lamb's blood. How much more, Paul says, will these which are the natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree by their faith in Messiah, their own Messiah, their own Messiah? Yeshua. How much more? Think about that. Is this new? Is this like a new concept? Okay. We're going to go back to the prophetic words of today's Torah portion, right where it starts. And this is really, this numbers, it's about these numbers. How is this working? Why didn't he tell us this in the beginning? Why didn't he tell us in the book of Numbers? Actually, he did. If you look in Hebrew, it actually says this. It says, lift Aleph Tav, the head of of the congregation of the sons of Israel in Numbers 1-2. Lift Aleph Tav. We don't translate it in English. Lift Aleph Tav, Alpha Omega, the first and the last. Lift him as the head. Are we ready to do that? Here it is in Hebrew. It's backwards, sorry. Aleph Tav, right there. It's written back. It should be over here, over there. You just cringed. <laughs> I used to do that too. I was like, give her something to read and like actually put it up there in anti Hebrew. Like in the back, written the way English is written. Lift Aleph Tav the head, Rosh. Lift Aleph Tav as the head. So if we lift Aleph Tav as the head, so literally this is what it says lift up Aleph Tav, who's Messiah Yeshua, as the head of the congregation of Israel. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. That is our job. That is. That is what this whole message is about. The book of Numbers, Bamidbar, being in the wilderness, is about lifting up Messiah Yeshua. When we're in the wilderness, when somebody else is in the wilderness, when we're in them, they're with them, we're supposed to lift up Yeshua. That's what this book is about. Yeshua tells us, I am the Aleph, the Tav. I am the beginning and the ending, says the Lord. Who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen? Are we ready to lift him up? Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Father, we thank you that you got this all sorted out. You got this all figured out. And it's nothing new. I see prophetically in your word that nothing here surprised you. It just surprises us. And it shouldn't surprise us. And it doesn't surprise you that we're surprised, but we're amazed. That all the way back in the book of Numbers, you're really teaching what's happening in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, you're teaching what's happening all the way back in the book of Numbers. And Paul understands it, and the writers understand it, and Yeshua understands it. Father, we thank you that in these days, you're lifting the veil off of our eyes, that we can understand it. Thank you for being our Lord, our Master, our Savior. Thank you for being the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. Our covering, the Almighty. Covering us with the robe of righteousness of Messiah Yeshua and His blood. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Akkad. Hero Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Praise your holy name, Father, for all you're doing, even in our day. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.